Hello everybody, I'm Maria Thaka and I want to start our conversation about ecology by talking about evolutionary ecology. And I know you're thinking this is an ecology class, so why are we talking about evolution? Well, this is because the living world has been shaped by evolution. So I'm going to start with a very silly statement, in fact, that living things are distinct from inanimate objects. Well, of course they are. But in what way are they components of the environment that matter in our understanding of ecology? And so individuals are actually the most basic unit of ecology. And this is where we must begin. And when we begin at the individual level, we have to think about why that individual is shaped or designed in the way it is. So what is an organism then? Right. So if you look at this image here of the Indian rock agama, you could describe this organism based on its morphology. So how it looks, for example, right? its color, its body form, the way its muscles are, the way its, the way its body is shaped. So you can describe an organism based on its morphology. You could also describe an organism based on its behavior. So for example, this lizard lives in rocky habitats and can run fast in rocky environments. So that would be its behavior. Or it um, basks all day long. That's its behavior. You can describe it based on its physiology. It's an ectotherm which means it thermoregulates in a way that is definitive or, or defined by its ectothermy. All of these would be descriptions of the organism and you could club that all in under one term, the phenotype. So organisms can be described based on their phenotype, which are components of all these elements, right? How its physiology, how its body works, what it does, its behavior, how it looks, its morphology. You could also describe this, this um, organism based on how that phenotype is created. So it's genotype. And so the genes are the ones that encode the morphology, encode the behavior, encode the physiology. So you could say, that an organism is one with a genetic code that looks like, a, like something we can sequence. You could also describe an organism based on where it lives, its environment. Now what has shaped or continues to shape phenotypes? So certainly the phenotype is influenced by its environment, but that has been shaped over evolutionary time. So what a phenotype is, is an outcome of evolutionary processes. And the fundamental premise about describing the phenotype of an organism is its combination of how the genes have produced the morphology or physiology or behavior how the environment has influenced it, and the interaction between genotype by environment. So the fundamental premise is that a phenotype is an outcome of the genotype, the environment, and a genotype by environment interaction. And I'll explain what it means in a minute. What do we have as evidence for genotypes influencing phenotypes? Well, one, for example, is that relatives which share similar genotypes resemble each other. So the phenotype of relatives is similar. What evidence do we have for the environment influencing the phenotype? Well, relatives, even though they share genetic material, do not resemble each other exactly. So there has to be some environmental component to this. And all of you have learned this before, which is a reminder, 
that for example, if you take genetically similar individuals, like a clone or inbred line or siblings or even monozygotic twins, and you give them different um, conditions, you end up with different phenotypes. So if you gave one plant more resources or more light, it would grow larger than its clone, which shares the same genetic material. So the phenotype is an outcome of the genes that encode it alone. It's also an outcome of the environment it lives in alone. So nutrient availability influences how big an organism would be, or a plant or an animal would be. What about genotype by environment interaction? What do I mean by that? I mean that different genotypes can respond to environmental variation in different ways. So the outcome could be a combination of what genes you have and what environment those genes were exposed to. I can show you this in a graphical form. So imagine that you have two genotypes. So they're different genotypes, a genotype in red here and a genotype in blue here. Now if you grow genotype red, in the red genotype in environment one, it grows this large. So it has a phenotypic value of that large. And so we can take phenotypic value to be body size. But if you grow that same genotype in a different environment, environment two, its body size is smaller. Now contrast that to genotype two, that when it's grown in environment one, it has a smaller body size than if that same genotype is grown in environment two. So this is a genotype by environment interaction. And we can see it in lots of different forms like this or the graph right next to it, where genotype one grows to the same size, whether it's in environment one or two, right? that red line doesn't change. So when genotype one is in environment one, it grows to be the same size than when genotype one is growing in environment two. Contrast that to genotype two that changes its body size depending on which environment it's growing in. This is different from an example of phenotypic plasticity. So I want you to contrast the two graphs that I just showed you with this graph, which shows that when genotype one is grown in environment one, it is smaller than when it's growing in environment two. And the same pattern happens with genotype two. Those genotypes are different, and therefore, they still have different sizes in both cases, right, in both environments. However, the difference between these genotypes is the same whether they live in environment one or environment two. And so the way we describe patterns that we see like this is that this would be an example of phenotypic plasticity, which means the phenotype that is the outcome of the genotype is plastic, depends on the environment, but there isn't an interactive effect. So as you can see, evolution has a role in how the individual is created and what form the individual is. And so therefore, there's a role for evolution in ecology. And it's difficult for us to think of ecology without realizing that organisms that we're studying in ecological systems have been shaped over evolutionary time to be adapted to the environment they live in. So in the examples I gave you by the G by E interactions, the genetic environment interactions, or genetic alone, or environment alone, or plasticity, that's all the genes interacting with the environment in ways to produce phenotypic outcomes. Right? And that interaction can happen within the lifetime 
of the organism. So for example, if the plant that's grown with high nutrient or low nutrient would be different sizes, but it can also occur over evolutionary time. The selection of certain phenotypes that are better adapted for that environment. It's an ongoing process. Right? So when we think of evolution, evolution continues even now. So the process is the following, just so that we're all clear about how a phenotype is created. So when environments change, that means selection pressure changes. So the pressure on the organisms that are there change. This means that the phenotypes of individuals have to shift to adapt to new conditions. And how it does that is, is through shifts in survival and reproduction, meaning some phenotypes are going to be better adapted in these new environments than other phenotypes, and those better adapted ones are going to survive and reproduce. And so this causes the changes in genotypic variation within and across populations. And that can result in speciation. What I'm describing here is the evolutionary process. But the evolutionary process is influencing individuals that are carrying traits and interacting with the environment. And so individuals in the environment are outcomes of evolution. And when I say the outcomes of evolution, I mean that these are phenotypes that have the highest Darwinian fitness. In other words, they have the highest reproductive success. Fitness, not in the form of individual strength, but in the form of how many offspring they're able to produce and leave copies of in the next generation. And so these are individuals that have suitable traits for their environment and are the outcome of genes that have been passed down from one generation to the next. So what kind of abiotic conditions would actually influence phenotypic traits? Right? How can abiotic conditions be selection pressures, for example? Right? Just look at these three images here. They're very different environments. And they can be described by different abiotic conditions, right? Differences in temperature, differences in rainfall, differences in pH, for example, of the soil or the water. It could be differences in carbon dioxide and oxygen levels, differences in soil nutrients, and even seasonality. All of this is the environment within which organisms plants, animals, microbes in, survive and reproduce. And so all these environments impose different selection pressures for these organisms. So for example, if you live in an environment like this that has high seasonality, which means it can go from summer to very, where it's warm to winter where it's very cold, then you need to have, if you're an organism that lives there, like these trees, you need to be able to have traits that enable you to survive in these extreme environmental conditions. But by contrast, if you live in a desert landscape, you need to have adaptations as an organism that allows you to live in these high heat, low water environments. So we can take temperature for example of the many abiotic conditions. Endotherms and ectotherms have different physiological adaptations to, reduce, to regulate body temperature. And so that means endotherms and ectotherms are going to react to temperature variation in the environment in different ways. So not only is their physiology inherently different, their morphology matches their physiological condition and their behavior has to enable them to be able to live in environments that vary in temperatures. 
And so, with that, I want to wrap this mini lecture to say that the biotic components in environments have been shaped by those environments over many time scales. It can be shaped by those environments at the individual time scale. Right? So individuals can change their behaviors, change their life history strategies, for example, um, in response to the environment. It can also change at the ecological scale, which means over at the population level, individuals can, can react to environmental conditions. And it can also change at the evolutionary time scale. All of this has bearing to the study of ecology because at each of these time scales, individuals, populations, communities are interacting with each other and with the environment to shape ecosystem dynamics. The next few lectures you'll have will be at the individual level so that we can understand how behavior can influence animal and plants, plants behave, how they can influence the way they access resources, the way they compete, the way they find mates, the way they move, and how they stay safe in a predation or herbivory environment. After that, you'll hear about ecological timescales and evolutionary timescales. With that, I'll end this lecture.